Live from New York, it's The Cube, covering Big Data NYC 2015. Brought to you by Hortonworks, IBM, EMC, and Pivotal. Now your host, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. We're here at Pillars 37. It's just down the street from the Javits Center on 37th Street. This is Big Data NYC. We run this in conjunction with Strata and Hadoop World. Dan Basquette is here. He's the Director of Technical Marketing at Pivotal. Pivotal, of course, is that innovative spin-out that uh, EMC and VMware did, uh, the collection of assets that they, they created and under the direction of Paul Moritz, who has since moved on to the chairman. Dan, great to see you. Thanks for coming great. on. Thank you very much. First so, time here. So yeah, so yeah, Cube newbie, we love it. So yeah, Pivotal <laughs> has been quite an interesting journey. Uh, you guys started out, you took sort of this critical mass, you created critical mass with all these sort of bespoke assets that people weren't sure what you're going to do with, then you started to build out this big data and cloud platform. Um, cloud Foundry, obviously it's had some great traction and great success with some you know, big names like IBM building uh, on top of it, and obviously Hawk announcements, and you guys putting a stake in the ground in performance. So let's talk about some of that. You know, first of all, what's your role as director of technical marketing? What's your focus, and then we'll get into it. Okay, as techno, techno marketing director, I, uh, I build a lot of presentations for the field. I do a lot of benchmarking, testing. Uh, I roll definitely feedback from customers back to engineering and help try to drive some of the product direction. So what's going on in the field these days? You're asked to come help evangelize, explain. You know, you're the guy with that the customer trusts. You know, you're not, you know, you're not a sales <laughs> guy. You're not a pure marketing guy. You got technical marketing in there, so you got some credibility. What's the what's the field asking for these days? What what are the customers asking for? Uh, typically, they're asking for really proof points around the technology. So they want to see. How does it perform? How are other customers using it? Right? How are they using it and building net new architectures to help get some of their, some of their issues solved? They're all from Missouri, aren't they? They're all from, <laughs> they're all from Missouri. <laughs> so. Let me ask, following up on that question, one of the things that we were talking about earlier, and it's a, a theme that we've been looking at, is that the Hadoop ecosystem is a center of such hyper-innovation that it's sort of spreading beyond the control of any one distro vendor or all the distro vendors. But that in, there's always a trade-off. That hyper-innovation you know, shows up in a little more complexity in development operation. You guys have taken a, what, what started out as disparate um, tools and engines and you're fashioning them into an integrated suite. Tell us what that looks like and tell us how that makes a difference in simplicity of development and operation. Okay, I think really the big thing, we started from a different place than a lot of the, a lot of the other vendors, right? We, we had sort of these, these well-established products, right? And really the thing that wasn't really well-established was the Hadoop ecosystem at the time. It's since grown up a lot, right? So we helped uh, found the ODP, ODPI initiative, right? To help get the Hadoop ecosystem in line and that, then we're taking our other products, right, as we build integrations between those, we're also taking those open source into the Apache, uh, the Apache system, right, so we can build this entire open source ecosystem. But starting from all the products uh, as really well established and 10 year plus engineering on these products, it's really helped us right, build, this, uh, build a nice uh, group or set of products that we can integrate really well. Tell, tell us about what those products are and, okay. and how they integrate in a way that's difficult to do with independent Apache projects. All right, well the, the big data suite really is the suite of products on the data side. And that's the Green Plum database, so a traditional MPP scale out database. Uh, Hawk, which is the really the Hadoop implementation of the Green Plum database. Uh, Apache Geode or Gemfire, which is really, uh, really for fast data. So in-memory data grid technology. And then Spring XD, which is all about data flows and bringing data into that ecosystem. All right, so the, we've built integrations between Spring XD to be able to push data into the data engines or pull data from the data engines. Right, it can also talk to things like Spark for uh, doing things around data science with MLlib. And then Hawk can also get, reach out into the other systems and pull data in from those as well. So I remember when Moritz first started talking about Hawk, he really played up performance in a big way. 
Um, in fact, you know, he's not one known for hyperbole, <laughs> and he was basically saying we smoke anything else that's out there. Um, that was several years ago. Uh, give us the update on performance, and then I want to talk about the architecture as well. Okay, well we've recently updated the performance benchmarks, and really what we wanted to look at is how our, our query optimizer, which was really brought from a joint engineering effort around Greenplum and Hawk, how's, how does that affect the performance, and what, the, what can that do in that big data ecosystem? So we ran uh, the traditional TPCDS type queries, right, and just to, just to see and get a feel for where we were in the marketplace. So we went with and looked at Hive and Impala as well and, and tested all those, not only for performance standpoint, but also to see where people were from a SQL completeness. This was, as we see customers out leveraging BI tools, their traditional tools they've used for uh, analytics and data science, right, they want those tools to be able to come in and into the ecosystem and work without a bunch of changes. So we use those query sets to test performance and that SQL completeness. Uh, and really what we saw when we tested performance is while the other guys have gained, definitely gained some, right, that optimizer really plays uh, to our advantage in very complex queries. And we're still seeing four, five X, 10 X, 20 X uh, query, uh, query performance really across the board. And we support all 99 queries. So for testing the other guys, they're typically supporting maybe a two thirds to three quarters of the queries in that benchmark. So they can't actually run all of it. So is that a function of just the efficiency of the code? Is you, are you leveraging memory better than the other guys? Maybe talk about that a little um, bit. It, it's really a function of how well the optimizer does in deciding what data to actually go and query, right? So, so it's not, smart. Not, yeah, not, it's smart, we're not pulling back as much data. And it's also a function of how we leverage some of the memory and disk across the system and pipelining data between nodes. Right? Okay, so, so we're very, very efficient about that. That's your that. IP, that's proprietary yes. to, to, to you guys, I mean, right, and that's uh, your secret sauce. Pro well, that piece of it, proprietary really until now, since we're, we've open sourced and gone with Apache with, with the Hawk. Right, so you, you basically that was your IP that you've now given to the open yes, source community. definitely. Okay, and then you're now building on top of that, right? So yes. we'll talk about the, so originally the business model was okay, we have this sort of unique advantage that we can sell, and then you realized, okay, this, as you say, this slow, steady decline in infrastructure software pricing, so you guys have said, okay, we're going to sort of move up right. the stack. We're going to sell services you know, around big data and obviously cloud, so talk about that a little bit. Right, and we'll still have a commercial offering of, of the Hawk product, right? We've given Hawk and it's the logo and the name to Apache, right? So we'll still have a, a production version of that, uh, but basically all the technology's gone to the open source. And really the, the driving factors that was, was really customers coming to us and saying, hey, open source is the number one item on our checklist of if we want to look at your software for this solution, it has to be open source, mm -hmm. right? So we, we looked at that and that became important. Uh, the other piece that was important was taking something like Hawk and we wanted to make it what we call a Hadoop native product, right? So what, what's that Hadoop native mean? It means, well, number one, it needs to be Apache licensed like Hadoop, right? Because you don't want to have different licensing and open source technologies uh, in that ecosystem. And then second, it needs to work with the other products in that Hadoop ecosystem. So the one released to Apache ha leverages Yarn, right, which is different than our production, the actual version we're selling today. So the, the version we've actually given to Apache is a much more advanced version. Uh, it works with uh, H Catalog to be able to query external data sources. Right? So it's, it really fits inside that Hadoop ecosystem, becomes a Hadoop native SQL product. You know, when I, when I listen to this, it, it sounds very much like what uh, Impala and, and Hive originally pitched, which was we're going to take advantage of the core um, catalog, which is you know H catalog coming out of Hive, and that Impala uses or extends. Mm -hmm. um, there is the uh, the file formats uh, Parquet, Avro, um, but it the the folks who built Presto at Facebook who also originated Hive, said that they really had to go back to the drawing boards because um, there were a lot of learnings they had since they built Hive. So my question is, if those learnings you know, required a new product at Facebook, 
might Hawk at some point become the native MPP SQL engine for the ODPI initiative? I think that's, that's what we hope it does, right? Not forward looking too far, I mean, but that's, that's what we really hope because it addresses sort of that different market where data science, ma machine learning, analytics, where Hive doesn't really play today, right? So Hive is a great engine for processing lots, lots of data across the Hadoop ETL. cluster, ETL, uh, some analytics, uh, reporting, uh, dashboarding and things like that, but when you get into that higher level function, it just doesn't fit the bill. And something like Im Impala tried to address that, but it's definitely difficult to build a database system from right the first line of code, where we're starting with 10 plus years of green plum engineering and come at it from a different angle. Okay, there's two angles on that, which is we know from Oracle, you know, everyone may disagree with the, or, or, or suffer from their pricing uh, levels, but we do know that 37 years building a query optimizer and workload manager, they did pretty, pretty well on that. Right. Um, and you've had time to mature, a decade to mature the Green Plum query optimizer and, and workload manager. But um, I, guess, I guess the next question is, um, what do you need to surround that with um, in terms of a platform that makes it easier to develop and um, operate, you know, not just the database by itself, but a, a suite of products that are, you know, uh, a data management platform. S you know, combined Cloud Foundry, right. com you know, Gemfire, Geode, um, Spring, Spring, X Spring XD. XD. Tell us how that fits together. Right, so, th so the idea for the data products is to be able to eat, right, you have the full suite to be able to create something like a Lambda architecture, uh, right, if I want to be able to, to do and that, right, a fully integrated. Our, tell our readers just a uh, quick uh, reminder just on the, Lambda. the ability to have like long-term data storage and fast data storage all integrated in a, in a single cycle, right, so I can query my most recent data and but also use the older data to be able to train my models for machine learning. Right. Right. So have all those products, but then taking that and making what we call Hadoop native, and then taking that next to that cloud native architectures, right? So if I go to something like Cloud Foundry, it really makes it easy for people to develop, deploy these, these solutions that leverage that data on the back end. So what we're trying to do is combine those two so that from an operator standpoint, Right, all the development, all that effort of deploying systems is, that's done. Deploying all the data systems for developers to leverage is done. Making the connections out to all your data systems is done. You just need to build the apps to leverage that. Right, so that's, that's the ultimate goal. So how much of the development and operational life cycle can you simplify today? And then what's the vision? Well, the operational we can de we can deploy today, right? So we have but beyond beyond deployment. Well, we can sort of start there. So okay. so we have we have the deployment pieces done. Uh, the connections to those from a developer standpoint are all done, right? What what's not done in sort of the future game is maybe reimagining what it means to be a data architecture in the cloud, right? Because today we've got these monolithic HDFS implementations and data processing engines, and today we're just sort of taking those and dropping them in, these, these big systems, but what if we could break out some of that functionality to make it scale at different levels? And that, that will be the, sort of the end game. Can you elaborate on that? That sounds uh, intriguing. <laughs> Can't really a lot today, but it's, it's, it's about just sort of reimagining re what it would mean to be in a cloud, right? Because the Hadoop infrastructure, a lot of people want to take that to the, to the cloud today, but if you've got a thousand nodes Right on site today, moving that to Amazon's not necessarily practical. Right, so smaller implementations are practical today. But but if I can if I can do it and be able to grow things one node at a time or one service at a time, right? So if I look at oh. Cloud Foundry, things are service oriented, right? So right. microservices. So if I can start to have data as data products available as microservices, so if I want to be able to leverage some kind of Spark functionality, but I can do that through some microservice. So the services today are too monolithic and hard to break down. Yes. And, and we need to get to microservices, throwing out a buzzword, containers, <laughs> where we can orchestrate hybrid clouds 
Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That are composable and sort of agnostic right. to the underlying Right, build your data architecture on the fly and not have to sort of just drop in this big chunk of so, data products. So obviously, well, obviously. Conceptually, there, you think there's a lot of demand from customers for it, that vision. There's definitely a lot of demand to move towards uh, public cloud type of infrastructure, right? It's just today, sometimes it's a challenge. So we're just looking at ways to make that a little more consumable. Yeah, and the reality is not, like you said, not everybody's just going to shove everything into the public cloud, probably ever. Right. Um, and so we're going to live in a hybrid world. Um, so you, earlier you talked about proof points. That's what customers want, that's what your field wants, because uh, that's what customers are asking for. Do you have proof points at this point? for what you just described, it's still early days? Uh, it's still early days on that, right? So the proof points that customers are interested in today is more just around that data architecture. So uh, we have customers leveraging the data products for Internet of Things type applications, right? Connected cars, uh, things like that. So they want to see that type of information get back to us and then distribute it out to the field. Because right, things like the connected cars, it's pretty specific to a, an industry. But if you actually peel back the onion a little bit and figure out, all right, the things we're doing in a car is maybe not that much different than what I'm doing on a, a fitness band, right? It's still pulling data in, processing it for a large, number of, a large number of items, and then pushing that data back out. So you think about historically the way applications have been developed. You have this sort of infrastructure silo, and then you're developing an application that, that can, uh, connects all the business rules and the business processes and del delivers some kind of value. That's sort of the traditional model, and now we have this distributed, mobile, all kinds of stuff happening at the edge, data's everywhere, data sources. Um, it's a big change for customers, so how are they adapting <coughs> to that change? Where are they investing? How are they sort of moving the steamship, if you will? Um, and where should they be investing? I, I, I think the big change is really making uh, Hadoop and these big data architectures more of a reality in the enterprise customers. I think, I mean, I've been coming to these the Hadoop conferences for uh, quite a few years now, and it's, it was traditionally the Spotify's and the, this, this big internet type companies that like, they were the, always the ones presenting, and you Twitter never. Twitter and LinkedIn, you, you, right? You, you never, saw, you never saw sort of the, the little uh, orange retailers selling hardware and things like that, right? The big, big companies, but they really weren't looking at that stuff. I think they're finally starting to realize the value of not only their internal data, but data they can get out from some public sources and start to integrate these to really build a, a much better model for making money over time. And, and where are they in that journey? In other words, um, you know, are they in pilot mode? How long does it take to get from pilot to production or proof of concept to production? Um, we've heard a lot of different takes on those early apps. Tell us what you I, see. I think uh, the majority of customers I talk to are fairly far down the journey, right? So they're, they've got Hadoop clusters deployed and they're starting to use them, right? Are, are they using them for very advanced applications yet? There's far fewer of those. Uh, still a lot in POC mode for those more advanced applications. And I, those typically are taking uh, three to six months, right? And, and then they're, they sort of take that information and maybe start to build an architecture of, all right, this is how we could really use this type of data. And, and what would be, when the POCs with some of the more advanced apps, what, what were those apps that you have in mind? Uh, I mean, a lot of IoT type apps or bringing uh, specific uh, data from uh, public sources, be it Twitter, or Facebook, things like that, bring them in and make it much more, I mean, it's, Really, marketing type use cases are still a, a big piece. Well, you know, early on in Pivotal's you know uh, career, if you if you will, you know, GE made a big investment uh, in in the company, and I mean that's sort of IoT related. They call it industrial internet. What can you tell us about that relationship or any activities that are going on? Uh, I mean, it's still going strong. So a big part of that relationship is not only on the data side, but also more that that Pivotal Labs and that advanced development piece too for building something, an application and, or a suite of applications like that. Right? But a, a lot of the, those, uh, the, the things they're doing around industrial internet, right? The, they need all that base data products and fast access to that data. So they definitely leverage those products. For Pivotal Lab is interesting. When EMC 
purchased Pivotal Labs, I was like, what? <laughs> and then, but it's turned out to be sort of this kind of tip of the spear, leading edge, show the customers the way. I mean, it's not necessarily the big P&L driver, I presume, at least in the future, but is that the right way to think about Pivotal Labs? It, it's, it's definitely how, how we like to leverage them in the enterprise space, right? Before they were, they were doing a lot of that, that internet company type thing, right? So, re-architecting uh, parts of Twitter, or things like that, but definitely started get, they started moving toward, toward that enterprise space and really show people how to leverage things like Cloud Foundry and our data products to rapidly develop applications that can bring value to their company, right? And become a much more data-driven enterprise, which is what people are trying to get to, right? They've, they have all these data sources and they need to Right, process that data and move their company forward based on the data they have. Um, just to raise an issue that seems to be coming up everywhere, before the conference, during the conference, with every vendor, how is Pivotal embracing or, or working with Spark? Um, I mean, because you guys are strong at the, at the storage layer and at right. the analytics layer, but not necessarily competing one to one with all the pivotal uh, with all the Spark functions. Right, I'm definitely interested in Spark's progress, and then taking parts of Spark and integrating it with our with our product line, right? In some, some hopefully some unique ways, right? So, I mean, Spark is definitely a big win in, in terms of uh, batch processing of data in memory to make things faster, right? So you get that immediate win over something like MapReduce. So that piece isn't necessarily as interesting, but Leveraging things like MLlib, right, for some of the data science machine learning capabilities. Right, so now that we're open sourcing our MadLib product and giving it to Apache, right, maybe some, uh, basically moving some technologies between those to make them both stronger. Uh, but being able to take the, uh, data from our in-memory data grid, or Apache Geode, right, and maybe make that available as Spark RDDs or the, or the other way, and then leveraging something like Hawk to be able to read and write data to and from uh, in-memory sources with Spark. So there's definitely a lot of different ways we're looking at integrating it. We definitely see it as a partner in the ecosystem and an important one that customers are starting to be in, become interested in. You talk about IoT, inter Internet of Things apps. One of the things that Spark uh, uh, is a, one of the use cases that's emerging as a sweet spot of Spark is a combination of streaming, machine data or time series data integrated in with the ability to filter and join and aggregate that data using SQL and feed it into a machine learning pipeline. Does that complement what you're doing? Uh, it, it can complement or, or we can uh, right, sort of take, take over part of that, right? So from our product suite, we can handle a lot of the stream processing and we can plug into something like Kafka to handle as a message broker and then we can, once we get the data into a pipeline, we can push into any of the data products and then also push it directly into Spark for MLlib processing and bring that back in, right? Because a lot of people still want that real time, right, completely streaming data feed where something like Spark is, it's really a micro batch yes. type thing. So it, it's interesting, some people, some people that causes issues, but it's, it's definitely something that we, we play with at any part, right? That's one of the nice things about the, this open ecosystem that we're built around Hadoop is I can usually plug and play any piece right, to meet, the, meet, my, uh, meet my requirements. So you, are you ready to predict what's beyond Spark? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sort of, <laughs> you you know. never know, I was uh, on the walk over here I was talking about, we were talking about some of the interesting companies we're starting to see in the market. So the problem I think right now with this ecosystem is as soon as an interesting product gets out there and we identify, all right, it has this weakness, well, another product comes in to address that <laughs> weakness instead of growing that product. So it'll be interesting to see if Spark grow, continues to grow and sort of build itself in a bigger product or does something come over and take, o take well, over? Well, it was in the Cube a couple months ago and some, I won't mention his name, but he, a gentleman who popped out of Google said, yeah, you know, when I was at Google, we MapReduce, we went way beyond that. Yeah, Spark, we figured that out. And then Google we're on to something data else. Flow. Yes. And so, and Flink from the Apache it's side. A great part of our industry, I guess. Is, it's always it's, something new. It's, it's always, always a problem. Yeah, it's always somebody trying to solve a, yeah. a niche problem that the other niche product didn't quite solve. So it, it right. gets difficult from customers, right? So you, they need to definitely looking to their vendors to provide provide that overall architecture solution, right? And I I think that's really what Pivotal provides is 
the big data, the fast data, the streaming data, and then the development around cloud on top of that, right, gives us a unique a unique position in the market I don't think the other guys really have. So Dan, I, I, we're out of time, but I have to, you know, so you've been coming to Hadoop World for a while, we were talking sort of when, when we first met. Um, you've seen a lot of changes, you know, it's evolved. Um, some of it's good, maybe some of it's not so good from a nostalgic standpoint. What's your, what, you know, give us the bottom line. What's your take on sort of where we are in the, in the ecosystem and where we're headed? I, I think from the, from the conference standpoint, I, I think Part of, the issue, part of the problems are that right, as, as your conference grows, you, start, you have to fill a lot of spots. So you, you tend to have a lot of product positioning at these conferences, which coming in as a, a user of the products, that's not really what interests me, right? I, I want to see, right, how do, you, how do you use this open source project to solve a particular problem? And that, that becomes interesting. So you really look, the heavily attended sessions are generally those type sessions, right? right. Hey, how did I use Flink to solve my streaming problem? So, so I think uh, definitely customers want to see many more of those and we try to do that with our sessions. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fun to see Hadoop grow to this, this level and have all these conferences every year, right? I, I think two years ago I went to the first Hadoop Summit Europe and it was sort of Hadoop Summit minus three. It was, yeah. it was the European market was sort of that far behind. It was really fun to go back to that level and see people, oh, this is a new, great, uh, exciting new thing that's fun to, fun to play with. And I think we're, we've gotten past that now and it's really about enterprise use cases now. Excellent, well Dan, thanks for coming on theCUBE and sharing you know, Pivotal's vision, your vision, and really appreciate your time. Great, thank you. All right, keep thanks, it right there everybody, we'll be back from the Big Apple, New York City, this is theCUBE. We're live from Pillars 37, we'll be right back.